today on Missing Link. What connects blood pressure with the stars? How are those twinkly things associated with desert sand? Where is the connection between sand and recycling? And what does recycling have to do with cows? There aren't any links? Oh yes there are, you just have to look really hard. Missing Link. The crimson fluid under a microscope. It gets its color from the red blood cells and the hemoglobin they contain. The blood flowing through our veins makes up about 8% of our total body weight. If stretched in a line, our blood vessels would measure 100,000 kilometers. That's over twice the Earth's circumference. Blood consists of red and white blood cells, platelets, antibodies, and other proteins that flow in the blood plasma. The circulatory system is our body's transport system, and it's very vulnerable. The composition of blood was a mystery to scientists for a very long time. Countless attempts to alter it or to replace lost blood ended fatally. In the early 19th century, ambitious physicians even attempted blood transfusions between humans and animals. The patients died. But the precise cause remained a mystery. In 1901, Karl Lunsteiner, a pathologist at Vienna University, tried to find out why blood transfusions often caused the total destruction of the blood cells and the death of the patient. He took blood from six test subjects. He then waited until the blood cells sank to the bottom of the test tube and the clear serum floated above. Then he dripped blood from one test person onto several glass plates and mixed each sample with blood from the other test subjects. As expected, some of the blood on the glass plates formed clots. He marked the samples that coagulated with a plus sign and those that remained unchanged with a minus sign. Gradually, a pattern began to emerge. Whereas the blood of one test subject could be mixed with all the other blood samples, the serum of a different subject would not mix at all or only with certain samples. Using this system, Landsteiner was able to establish that human blood can be classified into four types. A, B, AB and O. He also discovered that the types could be combined according to a specific scheme. Landsteiner called it the ABO system. It seems that all blood is not the same. Red blood cells in type A have a special surface and those in type B have a different one. In type A blood, there are anti-B antibodies, shown in yellow here. Conversely, there are anti-A antibodies in type B blood. If type A blood is injected into a person of type B, his antibodies will destroy the foreign blood cells. The consequence is a transfusion reaction that can lead to an anaphylactic shock. So which blood types are compatible? About 43% of Germans are blood type A and have antibodies against type B. So they can only receive blood from types A and O. About 13% are blood type B and carry antibodies against type A. They can only receive type B and O blood. Just 5% are AB carriers and therefore have no antibodies. They are universal recipients. The remaining 39% with type O blood have antibodies against types A and B. So anything other than type O blood could be fatal. This can be clearly seen under an electron microscope. Here, an unknown blood type is injected into a blood vessel. Within seconds, a life-threatening reaction occurs. The immune system identifies the blood cells as intruders and attacks them. The blood cells form clots, then collapse and die. This observatory in Hawaii allows astronomers to gaze deep into our universe and to spot possible dangers from outer space at an early stage. But what's the connection between blood pressure and the stars? Our streets are full of obstacles. We stumble over rubbish bins on the street, get tangled in Fido's lead and bump into lampposts. That last one might be for Johnny Head in the Air, a painful interruption. 
Such happenings don't just hurt and produce bumps, but bring about the impression that stars are circling your head. In technical terms, this phenomenon is called photopsia and is brought about by a rapid change in blood pressure. Put directly, when Mr. Not Looking bumps into the lamppost, his blood pressure falls along with his self-esteem. His retina become irritated and that results in stars. Incidentally, sometimes just standing up too quickly can also result in a preview of the Milky Way. So, in future, take it easy and at least allow the universe to know where it's supposed to be. Astronomers on the Hawaiian island of Maui are searching the skies for a different type of heavenly body. Asteroids that are on a collision course with the Earth. Just a few months ago, a state-of-the-art observatory was put into operation here. Professor Rolf Kudritsky, director of the Institute for Astronomy at the University of Hawaii, has taken a major step forward in the surveillance of outer space. Here, at an altitude of 3,000 meters in the middle of the Pacific, he's established the prototype PS-1, a new type of observation and early warning system called PANSTARS. Four telescopes will form the world's most powerful facility for the long-range monitoring of outer space. They'll be more powerful than all the other previous systems combined. Up to now, the main problem astronomers faced when observing space was their small field of view. An object might approach Earth from any direction after all. Now with PS1, they have a huge view of the sky. It covers an area 90 times the size of the Moon's surface. To do this, they're using revolutionary technology, camera sensors containing 1.5 billion pixels. That's 100 times more than the best digital camera. Each of the four telescopes is fitted with one of the gigapixel sensors. This makes it possible to capture more stellar objects than ever before. The PanStars cameras are 1,000 times more light sensitive than conventional photographic plates. Their so-called quantum efficiency is almost 100%. Barely any of the photos, the light particles coming from space, remain undetected. We have the same problem as a photograph. We face the same problem as a photographer shooting into the sun. There are some very bright stars in our field of view, but there are some very faint objects which we want to discover. We've solved the problem by splitting the camera sensor into a grid. This allows us to make short exposures of some areas to capture the bright objects. And in other areas we make longer exposures in order to discover the faint objects. So we're then able to observe bright and faint objects at the same time. This comparison shows the difference. Using the new technology, astronomers can take incredibly sharp images of the universe. 1.5 light years away, the Oort cloud surrounds our solar system like a membrane around a cell. It consists of trillions of comets which date back to the birth of our solar system. In June 2004, a large comet passed very close by the Earth. Astronomers around the world were filled with excitement. An object with a diameter of 500 meters was heading towards us within our solar system. It passed within a hair's breadth of Earth, just a few tens of thousands of kilometers away. I think that illustrates quite clearly the danger of the Earth and man-going faces from such asteroids. The prototype of the new facility is still set up on Maui. It will soon be relocated to the neighboring island where the other three PanStars telescopes are being built. Many of the world's largest observatories are located on the summit of Mauna Kea because it offers ideal conditions for stargazing. And Hawaii offers astronomers a good view of both the northern and southern skies. The air is almost always clear at over 4,000 meters elevation and the low wind turbulence in the upper atmosphere is a positive factor too. 
Mauna Kea isn't only used for scientific purposes. It has been a holy mountain for the indigenous people since time immemorial, a place that has to be shown respect. It is said that 10,000 years ago, the Hawaiians' ancestors set out in their canoes to discover unknown islands. As an astronomer, my canoe is my telescope, and the islands I discover are galaxies that no man has ever seen before. Kudritsky is exploring regions of the sky from which millions of new asteroids could appear on the radar, suddenly and unexpectedly. Only a few animals can survive in the world's deserts. One example is the skink, an animal that's shrouded in mystery. But how are stars connected to sand? Using a mound of sand, some build sandcastles while others choose to store it in readiness for roads in an icy winter. Scientists, though, have something else in mind. That age-old question. Are there more grains of sand on the Earth than stars in the universe? Stars show one group, and quote a figure of seven, followed by 22 zeros to back them up. Sand shout their opponents and make a mountain out of a molehill by calculation. Seven million kilometers of beach would be needed to beat the star camp, according to one opinion. But there isn't that much beach on Earth. Another opinion has it that the 9 million square kilometers of the Sahara Desert, with its 6 meter sand blanket, contains more grains of sand than the universe has stars. Who's right? And does it matter? Well, perhaps the best way to judge is to lie down on a beach on a summer evening and enjoy the night sky. Whoever starts counting first is either an astronomer or a physicist. Extreme heat during the day, cold nights, and hardly any water. But one species of lizard has established a niche in this hostile world. The skink is ideally adapted to this habitat, and it can do something no other animal can do. It can swim in sand. But just how it does it is a mystery. One of the scientists who's trying to unravel this mystery works at the Koenig Museum in Bonn. Professor Wolfgang Burma is a zoologist and reptile expert. The skink is his pet subject. The scientist knows a lot of stories about this lizard, including the myths about its alleged aphrodisiac properties. The ancient texts held in the museum prove one thing that scientists have been trying to solve the mysteries of the skink for a long time. It appears that the sand skink has played a role in research for over 2,000 years. But we still don't know exactly what it does when it goes under the sand. And that's one of the unanswered questions about the way this animal has adapted to living in sand. For centuries, dried skink was sold to men in the belief that it would help their libido. But the lizard actually has a lot more to offer. Nowadays, scientists are much more interested in the skink's real ability. Wolfgang Burma and the biophysicist Professor Werner Baumgartner meet at the museum. They aim to find out what specific quality allows the lizard to dive under the sand. To really understand the sand skink, we compare it to closely related species that don't live in sand, and to remotely related species that do live in sand. What do they have in common, and which ones are just adaptations to a sandy habitat? And how can we explain their extreme resistance to friction, as well as their low coefficient of friction? The scientists examine the lizard's skin. In a simple experiment, they aim to establish the angle at which sand slides off them. Their suspicions are confirmed. The skin of this reptile is extremely smooth, much smoother than steel, glass, or even Teflon. This special property could be useful to us. Sand is a gritty, granular material, just like cereal grains. Whenever such grains are fed through pipes, there's a risk of blockage. 
A coating as smooth as skink skin could solve the problem. So what makes their skin so smooth? Scientists believe the secret lies in its composition. To find out more, they analyze the component parts of the skink scales and compare them with the scales of other lizards. The chromatogram reveals the secret of the skink's skin. In this gel, we separated the component parts of the scales as well as those from related species. And the interesting thing is they're all composed of pure proteins. But in contrast to lizard species that don't live in sand, the proteins in sand skink scales contain sugar. They're glycosylated proteins. And it seems to be that the sugar is what gives the scales their special quality. Thanks to its special skin, the skink is able to dive under the sand. For 2,000 years, science has been trying to unlock its mysteries. The next step is to put this knowledge to use. A new approach to building houses. Architect Mike Reynolds builds houses with anything he can find. Garbage is his main source of material. But what's the link between sand and recycling? Romans of antiquity knew the value of glass and treated it accordingly. In other words, they recycled their bottles. Exactly how the Romans managed their recycling we don't know, but we do know how they made glass. The Assyrian king Ashurbanipal offers us this recipe. Take 60 parts of sand, 100 parts of ashes from seaweed, 5 parts of chalk, and you have glass. The sand, more precisely needed for glass making, is quartz sand. But it does have one big drawback. You need to heat it to over 1700 Celsius to melt it. And that takes a lot of energy. Through recycling, it's been possible over the last 40 years to reduce the energy input of glass making by 80%. Whether the Romans discovered the use of a bottle deposit bank to encourage recycling isn't clear. If they had, I suppose it would have been the amphora deposit. Mike Reynolds is always on the move. He's a workaholic and a visionary. While others were dreaming of spaceships in the hippie era, Reynolds created his first Earth ship. That's what he calls his building. Houses are mainly built using recycled materials. But what materials exactly? Oh, car tires, for example. The ingenious architect uses tires for outside walls. And once filled with sand, they provide excellent insulation. Due to their mass, they retain heat in winter and keep the building cool in summer. Reynolds uses up to 5,000 old tires to build a house. Steel tire casings are indigenous to the entire planet. The method of doing this can be learned in 15 minutes, so it's low tech. Now we started doing it to recycle tires. That's just a byproduct of this situation now. The real issue is that this is the best way we know to build. Mike Reynolds has been experimenting with sustainable construction methods for over 30 years, building houses that use minimal amounts of raw material. In the high plains of New Mexico, close to the town of Daos, he found the perfect site to realize his plans, a place where nobody will bother him about building regulations. It all began with this unusual structure, Back then, Reynolds wasn't so much motivated by climate protection as by realizing his architectural ideas. But all that has changed. We need to not be afraid to fail, not be afraid to make a mistake. We need to simply try new stuff and know that we're going to fail to some extent on our way to finding a different way to live on this planet. Mike Reynolds is always focused on his goal of sustainability and constant development. 
He has now built around 60 Earth ships in his small test community near Dallas. But each building is a new challenge, and he still oversees almost every step of the construction himself. His construction manager, Phil Basehart, first heard about Mike Reynolds' experiments 16 years ago, and he can't imagine working anywhere else now. It's a great experience to build an airship, you know, that you're doing something that has a point and a purpose and uh, is going to maybe benefit the planet, maybe humanity. There is that sense on the crew. Everybody feels like they're, they're in this thing that's bigger than, than them and bigger than just the individual house. Mike Reynolds is constantly on the lookout for new materials. He can't help it. Maybe it's simply in his genes. His father was a passionate collector and couldn't bear to throw anything away. He collected bottles, bags, cans, bottle caps, everything, but without a purpose. Being an architect, Mike has found a use for the stuff he collects. He turns other people's garbage into building materials. Even today, the 64-year-old regularly forages through junkyards and recycling depots in the Daos area. Here he stumbled across a mountain of disposable bottles. He studies them as if he discovered some buried treasure. And it's no wonder. These unwanted wine, whiskey and water bottles can transform walls into works of art. Aluminium cans make an ideal insulating material, and they last for decades. Melting them down to make new cans would consume vast amounts of energy, as it would to produce new materials. They take the place of building materials that are manufactured using energy and uh, shipped using energy. So there's a double effect by just using these found objects you actually start the building out with a negative carbon footprint. Reynolds has designed the Earth ships so that they remain carbon neutral for their whole working life. They don't require heating or air conditioning systems. They regulate the temperature themselves. To make the most of the sunlight, the houses have large south-facing windows. Solar panels provide electricity and hot water. The eccentric inventor Mike Reynolds has become a pioneer of climate-friendly architecture. They are high-performance milk producers. Today's cows produce twice as much milk as cows did 30 years ago. But what has recycling got to do with cows? Ah, cows, nature's very own recycling specialists. From a low-grade input food, they produce banquets. But almost. It's all down to their digestive system that has four stomachs. The normal, the rumen, the reticulum, and the omasum. All of them play an active role in helping the cow recycle its number one food input, grass, into a protein-rich food. The special role is played by the bacteria in the rumen that break down the cellulose of the grass. The cow then regurgitates the goop from its rumen and chews it again extensively, helping the microorganisms in their job and releasing proteins. Hmm, doesn't sound too yummy, does it? But it is effective. It makes the cow recycler number one and a green star for every extra move. Holstein Friesian cattle, also called Friesian cows. It's one of the highest production breeds in the world. The best individuals can produce up to 50 litres of milk per day. Holstein Friesian cows are designed for only one thing to produce as much milk as possible in the shortest possible time. 30 years ago, the average cow produced around 4,000 litres per year. Today, the average output is over 10,000 litres per year. Dairy farmers had only pursued one goal, but the health of dairy cows is compromised as a result because they're forced to produce milk their whole lives. The milk is actually for their calves, but they don't get any of it. 
it puts their bodies under great strain and it has grave consequences. The first thing people always mention is the decline in fertility. Secondly, there are other infections and diseases of the hoof. Then there are all kinds of wound illnesses connected with birth. There are also performance-related feeding illnesses such as amoebasal displacement. The consequence of all this is that 40% of cows are taken out of service every year. In general, dairy cows are slaughtered after about five years of service. These once undemanding docile creatures have been turned into finely tuned high performance machines. And of course, these walking milk factories can no longer survive just by eating forage. At the veterinary hospital, Holger Martins explains that a high performance cow has to eat 11 kilos of hay and 11 kilos of compound feed to achieve an average daily milk output of 40 liters. But the animal's digestive system can't cope with this diet in the long term. This is a wound that's healing after an operation to treat the displaced abomasum. This is a typical dysfunction of cows which is performance related in conjunction with compound feed. It's painful for the animal and expensive for the farmer. Critics fear that breeding cattle for high performance will lead to a dead end. Just a handful of prize bulls inseminate most of the world's cows. And this results in problems of incest. The once diverse gene pool has shrunk dramatically. One solution could be a return to the past. That is, breeding cattle that are robust and resistant to disease. But where will we get the sperm for insemination? The older cattle varieties are rarely bred these days. Many are close to extinction, and they're valuable genes too. A few cattle breeders have already changed their approach and have begun to breed forgotten cattle varieties again, like here in the Vosges. The robust Vosges cattle are well adapted to the low mountain landscape. They're resistant to diseases and relatively low maintenance. They don't produce so much milk, but the quality is excellent. And that's what makes this old variety so highly prized among a few interested breeders. Using Vosges milk, Jean Verret produces the rare Münster Jérôme cheese, which is highly regarded by gourmets. For cheese aficionados and breeders, this alone is a good reason to preserve the old Vosges cattle variety. The French government and the EU are also supporting the breeding program, thus ensuring the survival of this breed. Gene banks have now been established all over the world in order to prevent the further loss of older cattle breeds. Semen and cell tissue are preserved in their repositories at minus 196 degrees Celsius. The hope is that this invaluable genetic material can be used for crossbreeding in the distant future. This could lead to generations of cattle that produce less milk but which are much more healthy and lower maintenance. And it would mean that cattle breeding would become more humane and environmentally friendly than it is today. <laughs>